Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at another of Brian Holdsworth's videos, another one talking about an argument for God's existence. And this time I watched ahead, he actually does make an argument. Eventually. This is Brian Holdsworth we're talking about here, getting to the point is not exactly his strong suit. Webster's Dictionary defines getting to the point as to reach the main or most- I suppose I would be willing to amend the title of this video to my favorite argument for the existence of God because I'm not intellectually capable enough to be able to claim that this is the best or the most logically superior argument for God's existence. And it will certainly suffer from my feeble rendering of it. I mean, really, no matter which one it is, it's about as good as any other. That is, it'll have some severe logical flaw at its center. Whether that flaw be an unjustified assumption, a logical fallacy, or something else, I have yet to see any argument for God that is actually good. The best arguments are those from personal experience. I had an experience with God, and that's how I know that my version of God is the right one. Okay. That's nice, I can't really disprove your personal experience, so in the sense that I can't show where the argument is actually wrong, those are the best arguments. But unfortunately, those are also completely unverifiable. As an outsider, I have no way of knowing whether the experiences of a Muslim are more real than those of a Christian, or a Buddhist, or a Hindu, or any of the other ones. So to me, the most logical explanation for these phenomena are that they have a naturalistic cause, which results in an experience that is often interpreted as being supernatural in nature. Without having had such an experience myself, and given the current state of our understanding of neuroscience, is this not the most reasonable explanation? But of all the arguments that I've studied, I find this one to be the most persuasive and convincing because I think everybody can relate to it. It touches on every single person's experience of life and it's also not terribly logically complicated, so I think most people can follow it. Most of the arguments for God that I have seen are not terribly logically complicated, they just get dressed up to appear more complicated than they are in what appears to be an attempt to obfuscate their obvious problems. I also want to admit from the outset that there are reasonable and compelling replies to this argument as there are to any arguments. Yes, which is why actual evidence rather than just logical argumentation would be the preferred method for demonstrating God's existence. Philosophers have been arguing logically about God's existence or non-existence for thousands of years with very little in the way of progress over that time span. The way I see it, if this god guy exists and actually wants us to believe in him, his best bet would be to actually show up and introduce himself, rather than relying on apologists to convince people with logical arguments that have been refuted a thousand times over. There's really no reason why he couldn't do that, so to my mind, the existence of apologists trying to convince us that God is real and wants a relationship with us is itself evidence against such a god's existence. I sometimes get the impression that for those of us that are invested in content like this, whether it's in books or whether we're watching YouTube videos, that all we need is someone who represents our particular ideological persuasion to say something in reply to someone who has said something in opposition to what it is that we believe. And that as long as someone says something in reply, then we can be consoled that we've gained the upper hand. Certainly that is a factor for a lot of people, but I actively try to avoid accepting arguments because I agree with their conclusions when they are substandard arguments. Just as an example, I co-hosted the Atheist Experience for the first time last week, and the first call was someone trying to make an argument in favor of atheism. It was a bad argument based on playing word games with definitions and such. Essentially it was a reverse ontological argument being used in response to a cosmological argument. Argument. Just because I agree with the guy's conclusion that God doesn't exist does not mean that I need to accept flawed reasoning to get there. But just because somebody speaks last doesn't mean they've actually risen to the challenge of dismantling an opposing argument. But again, I, I will concede that there are good and compelling and intellectually stimulating arguments against the existence of God. Which then brings us back around to divine hiddenness. Why would a God who loves us and wants us to have a relationship with him rely on flawed humans making flawed arguments for his existence rather than just demonstrating his own existence for himself? 
With the concession that there are compelling arguments against God's existence, you are also conceding that God must want the answer to the question of his existence to be uncertain, otherwise he would not allow these compelling arguments against his existence to continue. And if I only ever had the logic of the two positions to go on, I don't think I could ever conclusively decide that one was right and one was wrong beyond a reasonable doubt. And so, when neither side can provide enough to convince you of the truth of their position, then the rational position to hold is that of the null hypothesis. Whoever is making the claim, do not accept that claim until enough of a case can be made to justify holding that claim. If the claim, there is no God, is not backed up with sufficient evidence or argumentation to convince you, then don't accept it. If the claim there is a god is equally lacking, then don't accept that one either. Congratulations, you've just reasoned yourself into lack of belief atheism. But so my hope is that a presentation like this will demonstrate to you that there are rational approaches to the existence of God and that faith can be complemented by reason. And by your own admission, so can a lack of faith. So I see no reason to side with faith if, as you claim, both sides of the argument are approximately equal. Which they're really not, but you know, hypotheticals and all that. I said earlier that there are compelling atheistic arguments just as there are theistic arguments, but my experience of experimenting with and exploring the possibility of God's existence is what overwhelmingly tips the scales in that direction. And my experience with experimenting with and exploring the possibility of God's existence is what overwhelmingly tipped the scales in the direction of atheism. So again, I ask, how is someone who has earnestly tried to have an experience with God but failed supposed to decide which third party's personal experience is the correct one? I said earlier that personal experience happens across all religions, and that neuroscience has advanced to a point where we can understand such experiences in terms of brain function. So until somebody provides me with an adequate reason to believe that such scientifically explainable experiences are actually supernatural in origin, I will continue to not believe that they are supernatural in origin. Because my life has dramatically changed, and I would say improved, since I placed myself in a pattern according to Christian teaching. And I had the exact opposite experience. My life got way better when I removed the pattern of Christian teaching from it. And by that I don't mean that everything has gone my way since then, or that God has answered everything according to the way that I've asked for in prayer. Right, because praying to God works just about as well as praying to an inanimate carbon rod. Hey, what is that? It's an inanimate carbon rod! <laughs> and no, my life isn't perfect either, but it is a hell of a lot better than it was when I was a Christian. So if that argument is compelling to you, then good for you, I guess, but the same argument flipped on its head is at least equally as compelling for me. What I do mean is that I've experienced a great deal more joy and hope and peace than I did before. Me too! It's amazing how much more joy and peace you can get out of life if you're not worried about an omnipresent invisible stalker watching your every move and constantly judging you against impossible standards. I've also been freed from modes of behavior that I was really ashamed of. That part is actually quite a toxic message. No doubt he's referring to something like masturbation or premarital sex, things that are natural and hard to avoid doing. So the message here is that he managed to stop these behaviors and be a good Christian because of his amazing relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you can't stop, then you're obviously failing somewhere. It's much better to get rid of religion and realize that behaviors such as these are natural and healthy so you don't need to be ashamed of them in the first place. Or maybe he's talking about drug addiction, which, again, the stigmatization of being addicted to drugs leads people to avoid seeking help and at a societal level has all sorts of nasty consequences. Everything from incarceration for simply having an addiction to the emergence of large-scale organized crime and the funding of terrorism. And at the end of the day, I've discovered a life that I found incredibly fulfilling because of my openness to those teachings. And if you're on the other side of two compelling logical alternatives, shouldn't the one that promises a great deal of hope and even eternal life create enough incentive for you to start exploring it with more consequence than mere speculation? No, it should not justify that at all. 
Anyone can promise all sorts of wonderful things after you die, and you'll never be able to hold them accountable if it turns out that they were mistaken or lying. And really, any time anyone offers anything that is presented as this sort of panacea that can work wonders in many completely unrelated scenarios, it immediately raises my skeptical hackles. Is this treatment good for everything from minor headaches to heart disease to cancer, diabetes, and more? Then it's probably bullshit. Same thing's happening here with religion. Not only will being the same religion as me make your life better, make you happier, give you peace, comfort, and joy, but you'll also spend an eternity in a state of bliss. Well, I can't promise you that being an atheist will make your life better like it did for me. And if I'm honest, depending on where you live, it might actually make your life significantly worse. That is admittedly a much harder sell, but at least it's honest. Because if it's a toss up at the end of the day, then I think it makes a lot of rational sense to bet on the possibility of God's existence. Which God though? The problem here is that at the end of the day, it's not a toss up. There are many iterations of the God claim and they all use the same justifications and rationalizations as you do for your God claim. While atheism as I'm describing it is essentially just waiting for one of the God claims to differentiate themselves by providing some actual evidence. Thus far, it's philosophical argumentation that doesn't get you past deism, plus personal experience equals whatever the person who had the experience happens to believe in. And it's a different one every time. And to start searching for him more earnestly. Every single person that I've said that to who took me up on that challenge was not disappointed. I'm so sorry that you've had such a poor success rate at getting people to take you up on that challenge. Because in my experience, going through that exercise of earnestly searching for God has taken a lot of believing Christians and turned them into atheists. In fact, that was also my own personal experience. I want to start out by setting the stage between two alternatives and to emphasize that you can't have it both ways, which is what too many of us try to get away with. I'm not sure what you even mean. I don't want it both ways, I just want to know what is true. And as far as I can tell, it is true that God does not exist. This is both ways how? The first option says that the physical universe with its cosmos, planets, living things, matter, and the physical laws that govern those things is all that there is. Methodological naturalism. The natural world is all that appears to exist, so we behave as though that is true. Sure. And so that any intellectual inquiry into truth or what is real should be limited to the scope of the physical sciences. Not necessarily. If you can find a reliable method of determining truth that is not dependent on methodological naturalism, then go ahead and present that. But thus far, naturalism has been the only consistently reliable method of learning about reality, and so naturalism is what is used to learn about reality. And as has so often been repeated, natural explanations have a long history of replacing supernatural explanations for phenomena, while supernatural explanations have never once replaced a natural explanation. The second option acknowledges the physical universe and everything I just described, but it broadens the scope of reality to include that which exceeds the physical universe and its fixed laws. But until you can actually demonstrate the existence of anything that exceeds physical reality, this amounts to nothing more than speculation. And it recognizes that we have many experiences that indicate that there, are, there is far more than those fixed laws. Well, like I said, there are neurological explanations for such experiences. Do you know what all the people of all the different cultures and religions who have had these personal experiences with their various gods have in common? Brains. They all have brains. Brains that can be easily tricked into thinking they are experiencing something that they are not. As a good example of this, it is impossible for additive coloring to produce the color brown. Additive coloring is when multiple light sources are mixed together to produce a different color. It's how TVs and computer monitors produce their colors. Each pixel contains a red, green, and blue light, and by adjusting the brightness of each of these lights, millions of colors can be created. But they can't create brown. And yet, as I watch Brian's video, I see that his hair is brown. So how do they do it? Well, to oversimplify, dark orange in the right context looks brown to our brains, so they make dark orange in the right context. And 
Everyone knows a bunch of different optical illusions that can be used to trick our brains into seeing things that aren't really there. On top of that, different emotions and experiences can be produced by using electrodes to stimulate different areas of the brain. So combine the fact that brains can produce experiences that aren't real with the fact that brains can be easily tricked, and I see no reason to think that any particular religious experience is genuine while others of a competing religion are not. So to start exploring those two options, consider the fact that every human society that we have records for, every civilization, has nurtured some sort of moral code of behavior. Which is entirely unsurprising, since humans are a social species, and in a social species, behaviors that we have deemed moral are often beneficial to the survival and propagation of that species. And in many cases, like the entire developed world of today, those societies recognized the most critical aspects of that moral code in laws that inflicted punitive measures on anyone who transgressed that moral code. Does codifying morality somehow make it more likely that it came from a god than if nobody had codified it? I'm not sure how that's relevant. And no matter how much we philosophize and speculate about the existence of a universal code of moral behavior, and try to liberate ourselves from it by claiming that there is no such thing. There's only what we happen to prefer. Everybody I know has tried to hold somebody else to some measurable standard of right and wrong. Again, I'm not sure of the relevance. Complain as you might about people who deny the existence of such a universal moral code, I'm just going to come right out and say there is no universal moral code. Pick something that you consider moral, and you'll be able to find people who disagree with that. There may be many people, or only a few, depending on what you choose, but the disagreement will be there. By definition, this means that morality is not universal. Now, do people wish others behaved in accordance with their own moral code? Absolutely. Does this mean that their moral code is indicative of the existence of a universal moral code? Or is it just a desire based on their preferences? Given the lack of anything approaching a universal moral code, it appears to be based on preferences. Everyone has objected when someone has wronged them, when they've cheated them, or lied to them, or abused them, and nobody would be satisfied with the retort, just because you don't like what somebody did to you doesn't mean it's actually wrong. That's just your preference. No, and yet, sometimes that is essentially the retort. As a perfect example of this, Kent Hovind is of the opinion that the government wronged him by putting him in jail for a decade and seizing his assets to pay his tax debt. Most people in society recognize that taxation is a necessary part of society in order to pay things that we all find useful but wouldn't want to pay for on an individual basis. Sure, there's disagreement about which services should be paid for by taxes and which should be paid for individually, but there is general agreement that taxes should be paid. So the response to Hoven whining about being wronged by the government is to say, tough shit, pay your taxes like the rest of us. If good and bad is just a way of describing what you or I happen to prefer, then we would never have grounds to say that someone else should behave according to those preferences. Why not? As distasteful as it may be to you, morality is based on preferences. I prefer not to be robbed. Most people share this preference, so we all agreed on certain punishments for people who engage in the act of robbery as a means of protecting us from those who don't consider robbery to be immoral. Now sure, majority opinion is not always the best way to determine the morality of a given action, but it's a better start than appealing to a supernatural ND who by all appearances doesn't even exist. We could never hold someone else accountable for their behavior because in order to do so, you have to concede that there is something objective and something neutral outside and apart from our preferences that mediates between us so that I can hold you accountable and you can hold me accountable when either of us mistreats the other. When we can agree on a goal for morality, it is possible to objectively measure any given action against this agreed upon goal to determine whether it gets us closer to or farther away from that goal. And so we now have an objective basis for morality without needing to invoke a god. If the goal is to maximize well-being and minimize suffering, we can see that the act of robbery will increase the suffering of the victim more than it increases the well-being of the robber. And one robber has the potential to increase suffering in multiple victims, so robbery is objectively bad for the goal of maximizing well-being and minimizing suffering. And no matter what anybody says, or what philosophy you subscribe to, 
All of us recognize this requirement and all of our laws are premised upon this truth. No, they aren't. You can find plenty of laws that many people consider to be immoral. The male guardianship laws that are still practiced in some countries today come immediately to mind, where women are not allowed out in public without a male guardian present. I'm sure the Muslim apologists in favor of such laws will explain to you how moral they are, but most people find such violation of women's rights to be reprehensible. But really, when push comes to shove, legislation is not morality. There are laws that are immoral, laws that are amoral, and laws that are moral. These are just rules that society has agreed to abide by, at least in democratic countries. In the non-democratic countries, it's usually some form of might makes right, which usually people are pretty quick to agree is a horrible way to determine morality, except when it comes to God. Then, for some reason, God has ultimate power over us, so of course he has the right to tell us what's right and wrong. And the fact that we have laws concedes this fact that this moral standard does exist. No, it really doesn't. The only way that would be true is if all the laws regarding moral or immoral actions over all nations over all time were identical. Since they are not, this betrays the fact that the moral standards being used by various societies and at various times have been subject to change. Think of something that we consider moral, and you'll probably be able to find a society somewhere that did not outlaw that thing. Stealing? Plenty of societies have had no concept of ownership as we would recognize it where resources were communal, so stealing wasn't an issue. Murder? How many societies have engaged in human sacrifice over history? In fact, Christianity is a religion that is entirely based on human sacrifice, and the Christian god accepting a human sacrifice is not without Old Testament precedent. See the story of Jephthah's daughter for that. Not to mention capital punishment. Most societies over time have had capital punishment for various crimes, but I would consider that an immoral taking of a life. Plenty of societies have not had criminal punishment for rape, and many, once again including the ancient Hebrews, treated rape as a property crime against the woman's father or husband rather than as a crime against the woman herself. Women's rights in general are a rather new phenomenon, with many societies throughout history treating women as property, something that most people today would agree is immoral. How is any of this indicative of a universal morality shared by all people at all times? Well, morality can be described as a judgment against what ought to occur and what actually occurs. Sort of. It's a judgment of what actually occurs against what we think ought to occur. There is no indication that a moral or immoral action actually has some cosmic superhuman power backing up our judgment of it. For example, if somebody abuses their wife, we would be correct in saying, you ought not to have done that. With my stated moral goal, yes, we could objectively say that that ought not to have happened, and you ought not to do that, and steps ought to be taken to prevent it in the future. Throw religion into the mix, though, and now we have websites containing long essays about the benefits of physically abusing your wife, explaining how this form of discipline is just like when a police officer disciplines a man by writing him a speeding ticket. And remember those laws I mentioned earlier about women needing male guardians to go out in public? Do you think those women had much in the way of legal protection from domestic abuse in those countries? I would think not. Also, you're a Catholic. You're a member of an organization that is so heinous and immoral that myself and many others are of the opinion that it ought not to exist. Now, it's important to pause and recognize that the natural sciences as a method of inquiry cannot tell us anything about what ought to happen as compared to what actually happens. Yeah, morality lies within the area of philosophy, but scientifically informed philosophy is preferable, all things considered. It was not through scientific understanding that slave owners considered people to not be people if they had a different skin color. Science is what figured out that these differences are purely superficial. It wasn't through scientific understanding that women were considered to be intellectually inferior to men throughout most of history. Science is what figured out that women are at least as capable as men. When you base your morality on religion, you can often come to the wrong conclusions. But if you base it on science, then it's easier to come to the right conclusions. Is science perfect? No, absolutely not. I am sure that people who lived in the 1800s would have been able to point you to scientific research in fields like phrenology that demonstrated that white people are superior to black people, or that women weren't as capable as men. But as science progressed, these findings were found to be in error, and we are therefore able to update our moral views to accommodate this new information. 
But if you're tying it to religion and an all-powerful god who gave us moral dictates, then you don't have the luxury of updating your views to be science-based. You have to maintain the outdated view in spite of evidence to the contrary, because that's what God said was right. Brian himself is stuck trying to justify his anti-LGBTQ stance, claiming things like sexual orientation to be a choice, because he is stuck with what he believes God has said on the matter, which is one man and one woman, despite the scientific evidence to the contrary, where sexual orientation is just factually not a choice. Family and twin studies have shown that homosexual or bisexual tendencies run in the family, indicating a likely genetic component. Several genes have been identified that are linked with homosexuality or bisexuality. Hormones can have a significant impact. Really, at the end of the day, it's likely a combination of nature and nurture that results in being homosexual or bisexual, but the research is quite clear that the nature side of it is much, much stronger than the nurture side. But Brian here can't accept that, because he's got a book that says it's immoral, and that book can't be wrong, so it must be the result of the gay agenda affecting the scientific research. The natural sciences are limited to consideration about the natural universe, and are predicated on the assumption that the natural universe behaves according to fixed laws. And the universe apparently does behave according to fixed laws, as you put it. We have seen no evidence to the contrary, but as soon as we do, you can bet that scientists will include that in their future work. But remember, morality tells us what should happen, and not necessarily what always does happen. Whereas science only tells us what does happen. It makes observations of what happens, and then it draws conclusions from those observations. Yes, and sometimes we humans can draw conclusions about morality based on what science tells us does happen. So, for instance, if it does happen that people do not choose their sexual orientation, then we can make the decision to not consider homosexuality or bisexuality to be morally wrong. I mean, even if it were a choice, using my method of measuring well-being versus harm, allowing homosexual and bisexual relationships increases well-being and decreases harm, so it should be considered moral regardless, but if that's not enough for you, then the science backs me up on this, so it makes your moral system look outdated and obsolete. But if all there is is the natural universe, then there's no grounds for talking about what should happen, only what does happen. No, we still have preferences as to what should happen. Remember those? You didn't seem to be a fan. We have an intellect and a will that governs the things that we do. We can choose between alternatives, and because of this ability, we recognize that we are responsible for the outcomes and the, the effects that we create through our will. I don't want to get bogged down in a free will debate this late in the game. I just let that play because it's relevant to his next point. I'll just hypothetically grant the existence of free will for the sake of moving on. We don't hold other natural elements or phenomena responsible for their actions. Like if a tsunami crashes ashore and kills hundreds of people, we don't denounce the ocean for its transgressions. We don't set up protests on shorelines and, and say, you need to recognize our human rights and dignity. No, we don't. But in your worldview, is God not in control of nature? Does God not have responsibility for his actions? Should God not recognize our human rights and dignity? Why do people who believe in God not protest his actions when they are obviously immoral, like giving cancer to children or causing natural disasters? And we certainly don't say, you shouldn't have done that. And the reason we don't do that is because we recognize that the the ocean and everything that contributed to that disaster was behaving according to inevitable, deterministic, fixed laws of the natural universe. Which God set in motion knowing full well that they would result in as much suffering as they do. This God guy needs to be cancelled. But when a person behaves in ways that we don't like, we don't say, oh, he's just, he's just behaving according to the fixed laws of nature. No, we say he is responsible for those decisions because he is governed by more than those fixed laws. He has some agency and ability outside of those fixed laws and that he is free from those fixed laws to some degree. Okay, I really didn't want to get into free will, but I guess we're going there. Essentially, we don't actually know whether or not free will truly exists. For any given action that you take, you have no way to determine if you could have chosen otherwise. Yes, it seems as though you freely choose whatever it is that you did, but do you know for a fact that you could have chosen differently? 
How do you know that that was your choice and not the result of the specific state your brain was in in that exact situation? There is actually evidence that our brains make decisions before we are consciously aware of these decisions. This doesn't conclusively disprove the existence of free will, but it certainly points in that direction. But at the end of the day, whether our choices are free or not, they appear to be free and so we behave accordingly. There is no evidence that our brains are capable of operating outside of the laws of nature, and the evidence we do have actually points to the contrary. But if the natural universe can only be described within that understanding of those laws and cause and effect, but we either inherit or produce a quality that breaks free from those laws and that sequence, then we have to admit that we found something that is pervasive in the human experience and which exceeds or transcends the natural universe. We haven't though, you're just assuming that we have. You aren't bringing evidence to the table, you are just asserting that because you feel like we have free will, then there must be something about our brains that operates outside the laws of nature in order to produce this effect. But we haven't even established that the existence of free will would itself even require a breaking of the laws of nature. So you've got quite the uphill battle ahead of you. You have to both demonstrate that free will exists and that its existence is impossible without an appeal to the supernatural. And if we're going to know or understand anything about it, we need to broaden our narrow-minded scope to admit and to explore metaphysical or spiritual reality. We will broaden our scope to include those things when they can actually be demonstrated to exist. So far we just have assertions. It's not very convincing. So now that we can understand that there is something, the moral standard or the, the law of right and wrong, that transcends the natural universe? Have we demonstrated that the law of right and wrong transcends the natural universe when we can't even agree on one single law code of right and wrong as a species? I see no indication of the existence of some transcendental moral code. What does that tell us about what lies beyond physical nature? Nothing, because we haven't even established the existence of anything beyond physical nature yet. It tells us that whatever lies beyond is intensely interested in our behavior, in right and wrong, in unselfishness and justice. And it seems to be instructing us in becoming more moral by affirming us in our good behavior and making us feel uncomfortable or ashamed about our bad behavior. Except different people feel differently about what even constitutes good and bad behavior. So whatever this force is, it's not doing a very good job at communicating its moral desires for us. The only thing we can compare it to is a mind with will and purpose and intention. You'd think a mind with a will and purpose would be able to communicate in a more clear way than making people feel shame with regards to what their culture considers shameful, regardless of what other people's cultures might say about those behaviors. We can't talk about matter as if it's guiding or instructing us, and we certainly can't talk about it like a natural law, because as we've already seen, natural laws don't give allowances for us to disobey. But if it were a supernatural law, as you seem to be positing, I feel like that would make it even harder to disobey than a natural law. And the fact that we can disobey and aren't forced to conform ourselves to these moral instructions, that tells us a little bit more, I believe. People largely agree with me about morality, therefore there's a universal law giver. But also, people largely disagree with me and each other about morality, therefore that tells us even more about this universal moral lawgiver. This looks mostly like you're saying, if I'm right, I'm right, but if I'm wrong, I'm also right. And that's where I'll leave it. From here he just goes into the typical, love wouldn't be love if it were forced, so we know God loves us shtick. So, as predicted at the beginning, right after admitting to watching ahead, so just about as good a prophecy as any found in the Bible, his argument for God centers around an unjustified assumption. In this case, the assumption that there even exists a universal moral code, and that humans' ability to freely choose whether or not to live in accordance with this code is evidence for God. 
Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the universal moral codes who prove the existence of the God that is my channel. If you'd like to be obviously non-existent, but your non-existence also proves the existence of the God that is my channel, then you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time! 